Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this virtual bridge session. I'm Sandy McLean, one of the team at CDN, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome Rachel O'Neill, Senior Lecturer at Deaf Education from Edinburgh University, is going to deliver this session, and um, Jessica Ramage is going to do live captioning for the session. So take it away, Rachel. Hi, everyone. I'm very sorry about being late. I'm uh, really pleased to talk to you all today. My name is Rachel O'Neill. Um, I work in higher education now, but I, I used to work in further education uh, for 16 years in Greater Manchester, where I was supporting deaf students and setting up services for them. So um, what I'd like to talk about today is these issues uh, about the pandemic. First of all, how can we find the deaf students? Who are they? Online learning, socially distanced learning, friendships, other college services and transitions. I think further education has done very well in the pandemic with students in general and, and shown the way for other sectors actually, uh, with adjusting to online learning more quickly than schools. Uh, but there are some issues which are very specific to deaf students. And also deaf students are not a single group. They're really a wide range of different uh, uh, needs and skills. So uh, the first thing, I think that's important to do, and, and even still do, even at this stage in the year, is to find out who they are. And it might seem strange, but uh, we don't always know exactly who the deaf students are in a college. So when students fill in the application form, they might tick the box, deaf or hearing impairment. Uh, and that discloses them as students. It tells you that they have a, a disability, and then that means you can follow them up. But not all colleges do efficiently follow those up from the enrolment form. There are other opportunities in induction and in tutor groups, whatever way you have of doing it in your college will probably vary. But it is worth looking at those application forms where they've declared because quite often those students don't go on to actually get their needs assessed. They may not go to student services. So it's quite important to to use the uh, information that the college has because it, it reveals who might need support, particularly this year. So um, when children, young people come from school, obviously many colleges have got excellent link programmes with school services for deaf children. And I, I know that like Glasgow, City of Glasgow, for example, has a very good one. The Ayrshire's have a good one. Um, it's important to think about those children who aren't supported at secondary school. They may have been supported lower down the school. And those are young people who might be partially deaf, but in a, in a pandemic, their learning situation is going to be quite diff different. So quite often, student uh, young people at school who are mildly or moderately deaf, they may not any longer get much support from the school service. So although you might have a good transition uh, arrangement going on, it might not include children who've dropped off the caseload, um, maybe at the end of primary. So it's worth thinking about that and asking the school service for deaf children about any uh, young people who came from school. I know at this stage of the year, you've probably identified quite a lot of them already. Um, and then there are the other issue about older students, adult students. If you have any groups of adult students, and, and especially if it includes over 50s, then it might include students who are deaf or, or, or going deaf because it's a very common um, disability in older people. It's an uncommon disability in younger people. So if you have a, any adult classes or any courses which regularly attract older people, think about doing some sort of awareness raising with that group to find out how they're doing with online learning. So when, when we have a deaf student on a course, it's not just a talking about what the student needs, it's also talking about the whole team around the student, the course team. Uh, and so in student services, if you can talk to the team about how they're running it, are they doing a lot of pre-recorded? Are they doing some live? Are they recording that? Or are they doing um, any face-to-face? -face? So finding out exactly about the course is more important this year than ever. Same with video, because teachers often don't remember that video should be subtitled if they've got any pre-recorded video. Uh, since September, we've had uh, the accessibility regulations come in, which means that pre-recorded video must be subtitled, but there's not always a great system in place for that. 
Another thing we need to think about is the literacy level of the student, because deaf students do vary a great deal. And many deaf students have weaker literacy skills. And that's really because they often experienced a period of um, lack of language in lack of access to any language in the early years. So that has a knock on effect when they get to school and later even at college. Their reading skills might be delayed. They're not always delayed, but on average they are. Um, and in fact, in many ways, that's like other students at F in FE. And that's why deaf students go to FE in larger numbers than might be expected. You know, they definitely go to college more than they go to university. Hopefully they get through college into university. So also we need to think about the different platforms that you might be using, like Zoom or Collaborate or whatever you use, WebEx, YouTube, because each of those different packages will have different accessibility features. So Jessica today is, is using live subtitling on Zoom. And that's one reason why deaf students really like Zoom. Despite the difficulties we've had with Zoom today, I've actually had no difficulties with Zoom whatsoever <laughs> throughout since last March. So I'm very upset about today. But um, both Collaborate and Zoom allow a captioner to come on. And you may be able to find a note taker who is able to become a captioner with some practice. Um, and then you'll know yourself if you have a YouTube account that YouTube is very good at um, captioning. It does captions quite well. You can leave a video overnight on YouTube or just for a few minutes and you will find automatic captions, which you can correct quite easily. So all of these packages that you might be using have different accessibility features. Teams has automatic subtitles, but not very good ones, not as good as um, many other packages. Um, Office 365 you can use for automatic subtitling. That's often quite good. So you need to experiment with that range and see what you can do. So in online learning, it's important to have a good mic and to wear the mic and to stay near near the uh, where the mic is. If you're having a session, let's say of two hours, it's really, really important to put eye breaks in breaks for all the students. I, I've, I've done this and I guess you've probably done this yourself. If I have a three hour class, which is live, I have 10 minutes uh, break at the end of every hour. And obviously group work and things breaks it up as well. But for deaf students who are relying on reading subtitles or watching an interpreter, then it's really important to have a break. Now, it, it is possible to get note takers to become subtitlers, but in general, in the UK, we don't have a lot of electronic note takers. An electronic note taker is a person who can type really quickly and accurately and to some extent summarise. Uh, and using the software such as Zoom or Collaborate, if you, if, or, or sorry, um, yeah, Collaborate or Zoom, if you use either of those platforms, you can get a note taker to take notes live, but it is quite scary. Jessica, who's working today, is actually a professional captioner who used to work for STV. Um, other, other note takers might feel more comfortable in taking notes to a Google Doc, for example, and sharing that link with the student. So the students see in real time the notes, and that's less embarrassing for the note taker who might not feel confident yet at being a captioner. So um, it's important to think about the peer group and what they know about having a deaf student in the group. So um, a deaf student might feel unconfident about doing this, particularly if they've just started college. But if the rest of the young people in the group or the students in the group know that there's a deaf student, they can do some things. For example, turn on their video so that their face can be seen. If somebody's lip, re lip reading, or speech reading, they need to see the whole face. And that is possible, but quite often the default position is turn everything off. And this is one of the reasons why deaf students prefer Zoom, because Zoom gives you a little bit more control. You can pin people. The, the usual way with online platforms is that everyone is uh, voice, is their, their microphones muted, their cameras off. But it is helpful for lip readers to be able to see the person who's talking. And also, if you have a, a person in your class who's a British Sign Language user, the deaf student can pin the interpreter. And this is where Zoom comes into its own because other platforms just don't allow you to do that. 
And Zoom's also got much clearer visual, um, um, is much clearer than other platforms. So um, I think that deaf people in general have said, use Zoom where you can. That has caused a lot of trouble. I mean, in my university, the same thing. They didn't want to do it, but finally we managed to get them to do it. So deaf awareness for the peer group is partly about making sure that people know these online etiquette rules and why you want them to turn the camera on when they're talking. And also it is really good if you can get the deaf student themselves to lead that deaf awareness, but many students will not feel confident. So it might mean you talk to them about that first and try and agree with them what they would like to be shared. So uh, yeah, <clears throat> if you have note takers or interpreters, it's quite important that they should be able to get into the virtual learning environment in advance. And I don't just mean five minutes in advance, I mean so that they can read the PowerPoints or any materials that are going to be used in the session. And this is the advantage about having in-house support staff, because if you contract this service out to a remote supplier, for example, AI Media, they will produce real-time notes for the deaf student, but they don't do this prep work. Interpreters do. Interpreters know they have to do prep work. And note takers who are in-house can be easily let in. Um, deaf students might need extra online tutorials to catch up with factual things. For example, arrangements about assessment, navigating the learn site. Um, things which you are perhaps a bit surprised that they might need, but quite often deaf students will miss information. Uh, being online makes it more important than ever. So having a few extra online tutorials with the right communication support will really make their life easier. So that's not the only sort of uh, teaching we've been doing this year. And um, socially distanced learning is going on in colleges and universities as well, particularly on courses which are practical, which can't be rearranged to online. Um, the, this raises a whole nother lot of issues. Uh, one is that there will be extra people in the classroom. And of course, when you're working out how many people you can get in a class, you might not remember how many extra people there might be. So you might have a note taker, you might have an interpreter, you could have two interpreters. And that needs to be, you need to remember to do that when you're working out which room you could use. So um, I don't know whether my video is on at the moment, but you can see this is an example of a, a face mask with a panel like the woman in the, in the picture. Uh, it's not ideal, but it does allow lip reading. And if you are in a workshop, the, the lecturer should be wearing either a face mask with a panel and or a clear visor so that lip reading is possible. And that should be something that your college or, or university can buy to, to prepare. The peer group is another issue because uh, not, not every college would buy um, a clear face mask for everybody else in the group. But I think it would be good practice because it means that there could be communication easy, more easily between students. Now, hearing aids are an issue when you're more than a metre away. Hearing aids usually work best at about arm's length. And so most deaf students at school, if they're moderately deaf or, or more than that, they will be using an FM system, sometimes called a radio aid. And that means that the teacher's voice is louder, whatever the background noise, and over a much larger distance. Now, um, when students move from school to college, they quite often don't mention the FM system, and quite a lot of secondary age pupils don't like wearing them. They feel embarrassed because they've got to hand the mic over to the lecturer or the teacher. But it's a good time to reconsider this, particularly now. And actually, I think it's a bit of a race against time to get FM systems in place enough in order to support deaf students in socially distanced learning. One person who I will really recommend here is Joe O'Donnell. He's an educational audiologist and he will be known to some of you already. He's an amazing guy. He goes to lots of local authorities providing support for deaf children in school, but also he supports around disabled students' allowance assessments and he will advise colleges for free sometimes. So he, he's a good person to turn to. The address is on the end. Um, He's a very nice guy who offers a huge amount of advice. So again, in socially distanced teaching with deaf students, catch up tutorials are important to check things that you might think everyone knows, but actually the deaf student might not know. They miss out on an awful lot of um, the sort of 
information which is passed on through word of mouth or sometimes it happens at the end of a session uh, information about changes of timetables or assignment deadlines so a catch-up quick tutorial is going to be very important as well so in all our colleges and universities in Scotland we all have plans the local authority have plans, the colleges and the universities and the health boards, they all have British Sign Language plans. And this is because of the BSL Act 2015. So this means that within, and I don't know whether you've had a look at your plan or perhaps you helped to devise it, but more than ever, it's become very important because uh, I've seen in colleges particularly, the status of BSL is definitely rising. I haven't seen the same thing in schools, unfortunately. But in, co in colleges and universities, it's now much more normal for colleges to book qualified interpreters when they have BSL using students. There's a few things to think about when you have the students who use BSL in college. <clears throat> One is that their BSL might not be very fluent because in school service, not many teachers of deaf children are really, really fluent at BSL. So actually, they may not be as fluent as you think they are. They might not be able to use it for learning for a while. Uh, also, they do need somebody who's separate from their interpreter to communicate with in the college or the university. It's no good if they have a complaint, for example, about their CSW or their interpreter. They shouldn't really have to go along to student support and say, I don't like this interpreter, but I have to use that interpreter. That there needs to be someone else in the college that can sign fluently. And so if you are able to find someone in your college who, who's already reasonably good at BSL, could you work out a way of putting them on in a higher level course so that eventually you have somebody who's really fluent? You might already have had contact with Deaf Action about the support for your BSL plan. Uh, Mark McMillan and Charlotte Addison are both deaf workers at Deaf Action who are supporting colleges and universities. And because the first national BSL plan is halfway through now, these two are supporting colleges and finding out from colleges how, how everyone's getting on. Um, and I think that um, one of the things that's an easy change to make in your college is to use Contact Scotland BSL. And that means that deaf students know that they can get through to any member of staff in the college at any time by ringing a number and you advertise that on your website. I think colleges and universities are all advertising it, but they haven't necessarily had the training for staff in how to use that system. So I believe the College Development Network is planning a future uh, network meeting about BSL plans. Probably Mark and Charlotte will be involved. But I think they have made a difference in colleges already. And the status of the language at last is beginning to rise. So the social things in college are also important. Um, induction, when it happened, was quite likely online. Uh, for deaf students, it's quite important to have a record of names and faces. Uh, so, for example, if you have a session where everyone can turn their camera on, one of those photographs where everyone smiles with the names added will be very helpful for deaf students to get to know their class. It's not easy to get to know students' names when they're behind masks uh, or online and their cameras are turned off. So that sort of induction event will really help a student. And so making spaces, spaces online, social spaces for chatting and face to face, uh, between students is important. Maybe your student uh, NUS or student group can help support that. If you can get the student to lead deaf awareness, that's going to be much more effective than you doing it. But that may mean sitting with the student, talking to them about how they can do it and what they want to have in that session. Remember that deaf students have faced discrimination when they go into the workplace. And that's why for them, they need more opportunities to do volunteering and to do work placement and support with their CVs. Now, it may seem a bit difficult to do that at the moment, but any opportunity that you can see, deaf students benefit from multiple work placements and are perfectly able to do a wide range of jobs. So they need to be pushed really to do more than one to build their CV. Uh, we know that um, deaf students going through college also need support about how to get into HE. Uh, they often get a bit stuck in FE and don't know how to progress. So any support on careers is quite important for them. Young, younger students who are deaf often might be 
rather dependent on parents. And that's usually, I mean, you will have seen this around with other students with disabilities as well, that parents want to protect their children and, and they may not necessarily have let them navigate things independently before. So they may need support in how to be more independent and how to be assertive. Because um, adjusting the listening environment is something that's very difficult to do if you're not assertive and for young people, quite difficult to, re to raise the issues even. You might like to use Otter AI. I don't know whether you've discovered this app. I put the link at the end. It's an automatic transcription app and it works quite well really yeah, for small group discussions or for the sort of chat you might have in the lunch, lunch break. It allows the, the hearing person to talk and their, their speech is transcribed automatically, fairly accurately. Um, it doesn't necessarily help the student, the deaf student to communicate themselves. If their voice isn't clear, it probably won't work very well. But it is a good step forward for a lot of students. Quite a lot of deaf students use their mobile to communicate anyway. They type or they use text and then hold up their mobile to a friend. So those sorts of social opportunities are very important for students. So within the college, there's lots of other activities. Um, counselling, you can imagine if you've got an interpreter in a counselling room, it could really make it difficult, the relationship between the counsellor and the, and the deaf student that, that that interpreter should also be different from the one that's in class there should be a separate service um, similarly if you're lip reading a lot of counseling is going online now so that might be that you're lip reading online or maybe using chat as well or text so the counseling service need to be aware about ways that they can get around that careers and guidance i've mentioned already are very crucial for deaf students they need more support in this area. Uh, there is a project run by the British Deaf Association. I've put the link at the end, uh, which is really worth asking for help for in relation to BSL users. But most deaf students are not BSL users. So just be aware that anything around careers and guidance really are helpful for them. If you can try and make it visual or if you can tell them about programmes that you use or set up sessions where you can have one to one or small group sessions. In most colleges, the refectory is a very noisy place. So if you've got any way of making sections of it less noisy while maintaining social distancing, that will be very helpful. And nursery staff, often very welcoming in colleges, but again, um, they need a deaf awareness as well. For example, you know, to take the masks off when the, if a deaf parent comes to drop their child off, that sort of, it might be BSL awareness as well if they're a sign language user. And, and so, yeah, the library is a place where people often ask very tricky questions. So, again, they need deaf awareness sessions on the sorts of things that deaf students might need. And, and I think library staff need to be aware that, that deaf students might have severe uh, literacy difficulties. Open days is an area which I think is increasingly we're doing open days online. And that also needs to be thought of. Like if you let anyone come at any time and you put a link up saying just come, that doesn't really help support students who need a sign language interpreter and it doesn't support people who need a, a subtitler or live notes. So having um, some sort of booking system where you ask people what their needs are means that you can put those things in place and you might have to have an earlier cutoff date. Um, I think most colleges and universities understand the principle of that, but they don't necessarily do it. Uh, also, the thing about transition into FE and out to work, it's very rare to get specialist assessors around going into HE. But assessments often are quite good on one area, but not on the other. You know, they might be good on hearing aids and FM systems, but they may not be good on BSL or the other way around. So the important thing around getting ready for the next level is to is to focus on on expertise. Joe O'Donnell, for example, is very good on audiology. And if you don't have an assessor who can assess uh, directly a deaf student using BSL, well, you could try to find one by talking to other universities or work with qualified interpreters or deaf assessors. I think most students like to try out lots of different sorts of support, which they haven't had the experience of using at school. You know, like electronic note takers are very, virtually unknown in school. 
um, qualified interpreters, again, who hardly ever see them in school. Um, also, most deaf students don't know much about what will happen after, after college, about how when they get into work, there is actually a fund available from the government access to work. Um, so part of the support at college should be telling them about access to work to raise the profile for anyone who's moderately deaf or severe or profoundly deaf. They need to know how to access that, how to start the process off when they get a job. I think I've already mentioned that, that multiple work placements are very important, even in a pandemic. And I know how hard they are to get because I spent a lot of my life in FE getting work placements for students. But they really are very important for opening up several possibilities of work rather than just this is your job for life sort of thing. Uh, and deaf students often do get stuck in FE. They don't necessarily make good articulation over to um, a degree and they need more information about that process. So here are the contacts um, that I've mentioned so far. So I think Sandy has this slides or we can um, put the slides up as well. And um, finally, I'd just like to mention um, a study that I'm involved in. I'm tr we're trying to find deaf young people with any level of deafness from 15 to 19 years of age uh, to take part in an annual online survey. And we're going to run this for four years more. So if you have any deaf students in your college who you know about, I was wondering whether you could perhaps tell them about this study and pass on this website. They get £10 Amazon voucher every time they do the online survey. And we're not just looking at people who are very deaf. We're looking at anyone who's young in this age group and uh, has, a, has a hearing loss. The idea is to find out about their transition to adulthood because of the, some of the issues I've mentioned in this talk, uh, there isn't very much known about well-being and self-esteem. Although the study that was this study has been running for a year, and we've already got some interesting findings on it, which you can find out on the website. So I'd be very grateful if you would be able to do that, because uh, it'll just mean that we we get more more participants from Scotland. Um, and finally, here's my contact details. And I'm very sorry about the uh, about the start where I couldn't get in. It's nice to to have contact with you all. That's great, Rachel. Thanks for that. And and you've timed that extremely well um, because we are almost up uh, to our, our 30 minutes of the recorded portion of this session. So we, we do have time for a question. If if anyone has a question for Rachel. And I can see there is one in the chat, Rachel, from Kyle Betty. Um, he's just asked me to ask you this himself. Um, he said, it would be great if you could ask Rachel about the additional barriers being faced by the increasing number of non-native deaf BSL users who have relocated to the UK and ways of better supporting these learners, um, especially online yeah. when English BSL is not their native language. Yeah, this is an issue in um, Dundee and Glasgow and, and some other parts of, of uh, Scotland at the moment. It, it, it is a real challenge. In, in some parts of the UK, such as London, the way they've dealt with this is set up online courses for people who are not first language BSL users to get fluent in BSL and English. Now, we haven't done that in Scotland City Lit is the only organisation I know that does that in the UK, and they were face to face. They're now doing it all online. But I think it is quite an issue. It's certainly an issue in schools. Because if you don't have good English and if you don't have fluent BSL, you're really stuck with learning. So uh, there is no easy solution. But uh, one possible solution is not very quick, is to put them put that student onto a BSL course. So when they're with a BSL, a deaf BSL tutor, they can improve their BSL enough to be able to then use um, an interpreter. The English is slower. Um, there are a number of English courses for BSL users. Um, and if your BSL is improving, many of those courses could support somebody who has got a different um, sign language. For example, in Edinburgh, we have a, an English class for deaf students, which is taught in BSL and some of the people who are the volunteers or the teachers are so fluent that they would be able to cope quite well with someone who is a beginner. But that, that's not an easy solution. There isn't an easy way around that one. 
Yes, I, I appreciate that. I have tried some of the live translation software that Microsoft provides. And when I was presenting to a Polish audience uh, last year, I, I just ended up with reams of laughter when the, the, the captions below came up translated. Apparently not, not saying why I was translating yeah. what I was actually some, saying. Some students do use very, a lot of translation methods, though. I mean, I have known students who are using Google Translate uh, to get the text in Word in English from their tutor translate it into their home language, which they're more literate in, and then use that to support themselves. I mean, students find amazing translanguaging ways to get to get information that they really want to learn. They might use textbooks from their first country as well. Uh, but they're never going it's never going to be easy. No, for that no. Group. <laughs> but I really appreciate you taking the time, Rachel, um, to explain some of the issues to us and at least th make us think more about what we can do. Um, and so that's all the time we have for in this recorded part of the Virtual Bridge session. Thank you very much for joining us if you're watching this on YouTube. And uh, we hope to see you again at a live session, hopefully. So until then, stay safe. <laughs>